Hey everyone, interview number two in this series with Greg Dickerson this morning. How you doing, sir? Doing great, Michael. How are you? I'm doing very well. So let's let's kind of piggyback on to our first episode where we talked about a booming economy in 2021. We kind of hit on two things and I'll let you choose which one you want to hit first. One, we had a discussion about when and if the Fed could raise. I said probably summer of 2022. You disagreed, so we can talk about that. And then we also talked about a little bit about millennials being impacted from the Great Recession your and I's business model changing from the Great Recession. I'd love to talk about what do we think the consumer, what happens to the consumer? What did they learn in this crisis that we talk about next? So I'll let you pick either of those two topics. We'll hit them both in this interview. Yeah, let's talk about the consumer side first and long-term okay. effects because that'll lead into Fed policy going forward and how they can how they can react. So I, okay. think, um, I think what a lot of people have learned from 2008 and 9 and from now is number one, the stock market, it's gonna come back and the Fed is not gonna let it fail. Fed mm. and Treasury will not let the stock market fail. That's first and foremost that everybody knows now. Don't bet um, against the Fed. Exactly, and I did a video on don't bet against the Fed and what that really means. And what that really means is, you know, you can take it a couple of ways. What it really means is the Fed with low interest rate policy is pushing you to risk assets. That's what mm -hmm. don't bet against the Fed really means, but it can also mean the Fed's not gonna let you fail. You know, let. Wall Street fails. So it's got a couple of things, but it's really about pushing people into risk assets. But anyways, you know, meaning equity stocks, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. Yep. Um, but anyways, in terms of the long-term effects, so 2008, nine, you know, there was a younger generation that realized, and us as, as I don't even know what generation we are, but Gen X, um, Gen X, Gen Xers, we now know that your, your equity in real estate is not safe. Yeah. That real estate, home ownership as the Lifetime and all that is not guaranteed. It doesn't mean anything. And equity can disappear overnight. Values can drop instantly overnight. We saw that happen in 2009. It just shut off like a faucet. None of us thought that could happen. We thought it would, you know, take a little bit more time. So we learned those lessons. And the younger generation learned that, you know, home ownership ain't all that. Mm -hmm. Now, what's driving the push now is interest rates. It's cheaper or as cheap to own than it is to rent. So a lot of younger millennials are going into home ownership, not from a wealth gener generating aspect or, or a wealth building aspect, but just because it's cheap, you gotta live somewhere. So you might as well at least build equity. So at the end of the day, you got something that's paid for if you're living there, but you can do the math and the charts and the research, it's all out there. If you compare the amount of money you put down, taxes, insurance, maintenance, all that stuff of home ownership compared to renting or compared to any other investment, if you put that money into the stock market or whatever, it's not a good investment, you know. Now, if you buy low, sell high, add value, there's always, you know, caveat. But in general, if you buy at the peak of the market right now in your average neighborhood where you can't double the price of your house by distress, you're paying market value, mm -hmm. you know, that's not going to double, triple exponentially over the next 20 to 30 years, potentially based on what we've seen over the last 10 to 15 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think I think there's a lot of things in there that the consumer is learning. And again, I, like you, I'm thinking about the millennials, right? They were scarred by the 08 crisis. Um, they've really sworn off real estate ownership for quite a while. Mm -hmm. uh, I, there's some numbers out there that kind of show that that started to change in like 2018, right? Because there, there, many of them are in their 30s now, right? Right. Um, so I, one thing that I do believe happened in this crisis that will continue is the millennial, like you say, is, is appreciating home ownership. And it is a cost benefit analysis, mm -hmm. right? There's plenty of articles about people saying, hey, I could rent in the city for four grand shoebox or live in the suburbs for two grand and have space, right? A, it's cheaper, right, economically, but also there's a, you know, a quality of life aspect that is just, just hugely more important. And I think, I don't think that changes. I think the more millennials that trade a $4,000 shoebox for a $2,000 home, they're gonna tell their friends and that, I don't, I think that momentum has started and it's, it's too hard to stop. So I think that, continues. Would you agree? It is. And they're getting older. They're having kids. They need yep. more space. So, you know, it's always going to be a transitional thing. And, you know, Grant Cardone, Cardone and I, you know, talked about this when I, when I did that interview with him yep. and he was asking me what I thought about the future of single family home ownership. And I said, you know, it's a constantly recycling thing. You had a renter generation coming up, but they're all young in college, mm -hmm. taking jobs, moving around the country. Yep. And then they get married, they have kids and then they need more space. So they transition out. There's another generation coming behind them. And then what about the seniors? The seniors that are retiring, you know, my mom's one of them, just talked to her last week about this, you know, selling her house. My father died a few years ago. She still, you know, has 10 years 
maybe 20 years of life left. So sell the house, move into an apartment. So she's yeah. going to become a renter, you know, um, and maybe needs, needs long-term care. But what the trend there, now here's a long lasting effect of coronavirus. More seniors are not going into senior living now and they're staying oh, at home and amen. doing at home healthcare, which is what my mom's looking to do part time nice. to go in and help people that don't need like medical, but just general daily living assistance. Uh, so that's a bigger you know, trend where people are going to want to stay in their houses or even rent single family homes mm -hmm. um, in order to, you know, not go into a senior living facility because of coronavirus. So I think that generation has been largely affected in terms of that decision and other families around it, not wanting to put, you know, mom and dad and grandpa into it, into a senior living facility. So it'll be interesting to see how that goes, but it's kind of a constant thing, right? You know, yeah. between that and we're holding around what 60% of the country is, you know, home owned, home yeah. ownership more, more like 68 but yeah 68 now it's almost 70 yeah, that's right almost 70 percent of the people in the country own their own home now yeah. and you know that's kind of a trend that i think that's actually ticking up with the interest rate environment it is absolutely yeah i think i think that really could hit 70 percent. the record 71 back mm -hmm. in 06 but that was that was a very fake i mean basically you took three percent of renters who should have never left moved them over then they went back so but i think we can get to a legitimate 70 percent uh, probably in the next 18 to 20 months, assuming rates stay low. The other, a couple other things that I think are, are changing is A, businesses, right? I was in sales for a tech company. I believe this is true for most sales companies or sales roles in companies. You know, I used to travel 100, 200,000 miles a year on airplanes. Uh, yes, there'll still be some of that business travel, but I don't think business travel gets back to 09, 2019 peak anytime soon. It's cheaper yeah. to do Zoom calls. It's, it's, you know, you can just do it differently. Oh, by the way, I also think businesses are, are leaving high tax states like California. It's why San Francisco's in so much pain and they're going to get rid of the huge office and they're going to go to lots of little silos, right? The whole, you have a, you have a desk, you have a, you know, you have an office, uh, I think changes for many companies and, and it, and it, oh, by the way, it's more profitable, right? You lower cost by doing that. And again, mm -hmm. back to the millennials, it's better quality of life. Right. You can now. Well, and it opens up for a business, you know, a workforce that's global. Absolutely. So you no longer have to require, hey, you got to live here. Now I can hire somebody anywhere, Australia, mm -hmm. Canada, Singapore, you know, Costa whatever. Costa Rica, whatever. Yep. Yeah. India, you know, uh, Philippines, yep. you know, high, you know, quality talent people, uh, you know, people are getting more and more used to it. Now, is that going to eliminate the human connection? Absolutely not. I mean, I. I had a meeting with a, you know, one of my clients out in California, you know, flew into town last week to look at some properties, you know, uh, deals that they're getting ready to take down multifamily properties. And he's like, man, I'm sick of this zoom stuff. You know, ah. I'm going to meet in person. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we had a chance to meet and, um, you know, it's, it's really interesting. I work with people all over the world, but yeah, people are getting more and more comfortable with zoom. They're realizing, man, the expense of travel, the, the logistics of it, the cost of office space, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I think we, we know, the business world has fundamentally changed. Our face-to-face, in-person, is that going away? No, that's no. never going to go away. We are, like you said, we're social. We need that connection. There's something to be said for an in-office collaborative environment. Mm -hmm. So for most companies, there's a core of that aspect of the environment that just sure. can't go away with different types of companies. But then there's others that are much more efficient, much more functional, just the opposite. Yeah. So it's going to be really interesting to see how that continues to change post coronavirus. Yeah, and again, I think there's still lots of innovation, lots of investment coming. Um, I mean, just think about, I mean, WebEx, just for example, right? It's a part of Cisco systems. When I was in, when I was a leadership person in, in tech, right? We would basically, we would trick out one conference room per floor with web conferencing, right? And high, high def video. Uh, now I bet you every conference room will have high def video because it, oh, yeah. it'll be, very rare that everybody is always in a meeting, right? There'll always be some remote segments, but again, that's investment. It's, it's cost. I mean, it's again, I think 2021 is going to be a, a really good year. The other thing well, I, I toured a, uh, I toured a building uh, Friday with a friend of mine that's um, overseeing a hundred million dollar uh, uh, building office building in downtown Charlottesville and a good, I don't know, a quarter of it's going to be co-working space oh. and every area, every level just what you said, multimedia conference rooms, podcast studio. We talked about a broadcast studio. 
you know, I said, man, you got to have a video broadcast studio where you can yeah. come in and do like, you know, these types of shows and have a, have a little touch board and all that. So, you know, they're going to be open in 2021, but you know, unbelievable co-working space, 200 seat auditorium, multimedia, you know, the whole nine yards and then, you know, different collaborative individual environments, open space. Yeah. It's going to be, it's going to be really, really awesome. And it's the center, um, uh, center of developing entrepreneurship is, is what the building's all about in Charlottesville. And, um, you know, it's, uh, so yeah, to your point, I mean, that's, that's the trend. Now here's a business model that I think is going to be going to be killer as soon as this is over and the world opens back up is conference business. Mm. People are going to be wanting to get back out, going to conferences, mingling, making those connections. So I think, I think if anybody's thinking about, should I do a conference in 2021? Absolutely. People are going to be dying to get to a yeah, conference. Yeah, dying to get out. And then the other thing I want to think about again, about what's changed, what has changed is, I don't know if this is more of a hope or it's a reality. So I'll be, I'm going to love to hear your feedback. I think more and more consumers, the average mom and pop, average Joe is going to be really appreciating the emergency fund, right? They're going to save more. They're going to spend less. And um, I think, I, I, you know, this crisis went on longer and deeper than maybe people were ready for. And um, the lack of stimulus the second time is painful. So I want to hope people remember to save more coming out of this. Do you think that's possible? Do you think we're just going to go back to buying everything hand over fist once we're, once we're out? You know, people have short memories. So mm -hmm. number one, right now, one of the concerns of the Fed is savings. So savings are up. People are, mm -hmm. people are saving money. They're not spending. That's a big concern of the Fed because they're like, how do we get people spending yeah. more money? Because yeah. that's how you increase, you know, the economy. We're a consumption-based economy in the United States now. Um, so that is a big concern. Uh, I think there's a lot of ground that people need to make up after this, you know, 30% of the economy that got wiped out mm -hmm. uh, and put out of business, those individuals, you know, they have to rebuild before they can redeploy, yep. before they can spend exponentially. But, you know, we're consumers, man, people are going to spend money, you know, um, the question is, how much are they going to spend? So, you know, once we get to the other side of it, people have, you know, kind of made up for what they lost a little bit, get their feet back under them. I mean, it's just like anything else. They'll be right back out there spending again because that's well, just that's just how we're wired in the, in the economy and the world that we live in. Well, I can tell you one of the first things I'm doing is I might I might take a month off and just go on a month long vacation. I, I I'm yeah. owed a couple of vacations as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> it's really interesting. Again, it wasn't this hasn't been a bad enough, deep enough thing. So if you think about the Great Depression and the effect that had on our grandparents. Yeah, right. I mean, that, that was long lasting scarring effects where they didn't want to spend money. Mm -hmm. They stockpiled food. You know, they were ready for that to happen again. You yeah. and I went through 2008 and nine. So financially from a, uh, you know, reserve aspect of, of assets and real estate things, we know now, man, you better keep some reserves. You better not put any, you know, you better not guarantee that debt and you better not have equity at stake mm -hmm. because, you know, the banks can and will call your loan due at will if they need to and want to, and yep. the environment, um, you know, is more favorable for them to do so. So, you know, we learn that, you mm -hmm. know, but, uh, you know, and that's something that's going to stick with us. And then when you look at this, you know, this just hasn't been the kind of thing that's going to be, I think, permanently damaging to people mm. because it hasn't been that bad overall. I mean, it's been bad, but people have died, all, you know, don't get me wrong, but it's not like the Spanish flu where the people were dropping in 24 hours and you had millions of people dying. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not like that, you know, at least in this country, you know, maybe sure. around the world, there might be that many deaths, but um, it just hasn't been, and there's been, and there's still people that still deny it's even a thing. I mean, there's yeah. actually people still walk around going, ah, it's ah, not it's even fake. a real thing. <laughs> yeah. They're making it up there. You know, I mean, it's just like, I don't know. I think almost everybody now knows somebody who's, who's come down with the virus. I oh think yeah. It's at I, that point now. Yeah. I mean, I actually know somebody that was on a ventilator for five days. So yeah. I mean, yeah. I think almost, I don't know anybody that went that far, but I know people that have had it and, you know, different levels of, mm -hmm. you know, issues with it. So I think now more and more people are realizing, well, you know, the virus is real, but it's not that dangerous. So right. this is not behavior altering like those other events are. So I think people, once they're back out again and, you know, the lights are on and everything's good and they're, they're making money again, I think they're just going to, you know, cool. people aren't do what they do, you know? Yeah. Well, let's talk about that. That's actually a great transition because again, one of the things I said in our first video today is uh, a, that video was all about a bang up or growing 2021. And I yeah. actually put out there that, you know, I think the fed's going to be put into a corner uh, and have to raise rates by the summer of 2022. So call that early, late Q2, early Q3, 
2022. So that's, what would that be? Seven quarters from now. Yeah. Um, and you're like, no, nah, Zuber too early, not going to happen. They can't do it. Uh, so let's, let's talk about that. Cause again, I, I think they're going to have to, I think right now they're what zero to a quarter. It's kind of back to their great recession levels. I think they've got to go. I think they've got to get the federal funds rates to 1%. Uh, and it starts with a quarter ju- jump in uh, summer of 2022. Yeah. So what do you think? You know, the problem with that is the economy isn't back. It hasn't recovered. And every time the Fed tried to raise rates before the coronavirus, Mm -hmm. you know, the market started selling off. The the economy came to a standstill. You know, the two things that will kill the real estate market dead in its tracks, like it did 2008, nine, number one is interest rates. Totally. Number two is funding. If you can't borrow the money and the interest rates are too high, you know, interest rates will affect values, but if you can't borrow money, Boom. Done. Without the money, there is no deal. So if the Fed starts raising rates, that's going to trigger, and a lot of these loans are interest only, that's going to trigger a lot of defaults. It's going to, so they know that. They know that, hey, it's well, not that, just So let's just market. round that out. It's uh, most, well, I believe most residential loans are not interest only. You're referring. I don't know what that number is. You know, uh, it'd be interesting to know how many of them went short term interest only, but I know most commercial yeah. is short term interest only. For short term sure. meaning, you know, five, maybe 10 years. Yeah. Residential, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you would think that they would lock into 30 year, but God, you it'd be hope. interesting to know what that statistic is. And I just I'll just look don't it up for next time. I'll look it up. For yeah, next. that'd be interesting to know. But let's but yeah, assume commercial. it is. Yeah. Yeah. Let's assume it is long term. So it's not really going to affect. Uh, your existing loan that you locked mm-hmm. into, but it's going to affect the value of your property now when you want to go sell. Totally. So now you're not going to be able to sell. So that triggers a whole nother issue, um, you know, down the road as rates raise. But the biggest issue is the stock market. Oh, That's yeah. where the majority of, you know, the baby boomer wealth is held, you know, is in, is in a lot of them have money in the stock market. And, you know, the Fed has to prop that up and has to keep it going. So they're kind of they're kind of being held hostage by the mm. market right now. So they're going to have to make a decision. Do we let that tank in order to raise rates? Do we let real estate value? I mean, that will cause I, I that would cause depression. Really? Yeah. I see, think so. so I think I think there's a couple of things I want to just go in there. One of the first things that would happen if rates went up, and I'm not talking up like double. I'm talking from three to four percent, right? A thirty. Yeah. We're talking thirty year fixed residential. Right. So let's just assume the average is it's actually 2.8. Let's just call it three. And it goes to 4%. One of the things that definitely stops is transactions. Right. Are we talking within a year? No. Yeah. I'm talking about the summer of actually, I'm only talking about a first bump. So to go up from three to 4%, let's just call it the end of 2022. So what's that? Four, eight, nine quarters from now. Um, That would definitely stop transactions because what's happening now is people are getting, you know, 3% loans and their payment is 1200 bucks. What they're, and usually what happens is you move up, right? You go from that first home, you, you're a move up buyer. But if you're a move up buyer and you, you, know, you, you, you spend an extra hundred grand, but your rate also ticks up, you get a double whammy, mm-hmm. right? So I think what happens to your point is transactions stop because you suddenly yeah. look at your house and go, hey, I'll just paint it. I'll add tile. I'll do this. I'll do that. And I just won't go get that next home. So you're right. I think if rates go up, transactions fall off a cliff. Yeah. And it becomes cheaper to rent. So yeah. at that point, you know, that decision, person. and it's probably that 4% threshold. Number one, it's a mental threshold. It's kind of like $3 gas, you know, yeah. where you're at probably $4 gas, <laughs> you know, out here it's three. If you're below three, you're okay. You get yeah. over three, that changes people's behavior. Interesting. So interest rates, it used to be 5%. Yeah. The closer you got to 5%, that's when the market, real estate market, single family started having issues. Commercial, you know, multifamily is different. Um, you know, cause that, that's just a different animal, but single family, yeah. you know, that was the threshold. Then it was four. Now it's three. Yeah. You start getting over 3%, boom, it, it's going to fall off a cliff. You get to four, that's Armageddon in the single family real estate market. Yeah. So let's, the other thing that's, that's going to, that's going to reduce values by 30 to 40% going from where we are now to mm-hmm. 4%, 2.75 to four on a 30 year fixed that devalues your property about 30% based mm-hmm. on what the affordability factor of the payment. Yeah. I'd have to do the math on that, but yeah, it, it certainly reduces the value for sure. I mean, like, like for like payment is what you're referring to. So yeah, t- totally yeah. get that. The other thing that I think is why the Fed is going to have to raise rates is I, I don't believe they're going to be able to hide inflation. I think inflation has always been a little bit more in the consumer's pocket than they want to admit. It's a managed yeah. CPI. I don't think they're going to have a chance to fix it. We've already seen it in lumber, right? It's causing Pulte homes to slow production, right? Because they're like, hey, that's a short-term blip. 
let the supply chain come in. But if yeah. 2021 gets going, uh, I believe we're going to see inflation in labor. Yes, labor, right? Just think about that mall conversion, the, all these things that need to change, that need to hire people. Think about healthcare. Healthcare is going to need uh, the whole, like your mom, right? The, the whole uh, at care for elderly. I mean, all these things are going to be changing. It's going to be very disruptive and people are going to have to get retrained. But the outcome of this is employment gets better. And I think wages go up. And if wages go up, I mean, that's the boogeyman for inflation because then, then everything goes. Uh, but that's, I, you know, I might be, you know, maybe my uh, time horizon is too short, certainly. But again, I'm pretty excited. It would, excited take, by it would take a lot more than just the booming economy because we were already there. So we were already there pre-coronavirus. Wages were not on pace with mm -hmm. yeah. Housing. Wages were not going not, anywhere. Yep. It was you know that's the whole thing. Housing's gone up, rents gone up, all that, but wages haven't. And that's what yes. I tell everybody in the world of renting, single-family, multifamily, whatever. You're going to reach a point of where you where people are going to push back. You can only charge so much. People only are only making so much money. Yes. Their incomes have not gone up in relation to increasing housing costs. So totally you know agree. once you hit that point, people just stop spending. They just totally. push back. So it's going to balance itself. The only way you're going to get real in inflation at the consumer level, which is what the Fed has not been able to do so far, mm -hmm. is you got to put money in everybody's pocket, everybody. So mm -hmm. what you just said, when are people going to stop saving and start spending? If all of a sudden the Fed just loaded your bank account with yeah. all the money you lost during coronavirus and then some, well, you're going to go out and spend it. Mm -hmm. But until that happens, not only do you need to make up for what you lost, but you need to add what you would have exponentially gained as well you know, which means double. So if you're in a business and you lost, you know, you had to close and you lost your $100,000 income, that means they got to give you 200,000 for you to go out and freely spend mm -hmm. at a level that would create inflationary demand. The only reason lumber is up because it's a speculative play because mm -hmm. of the housing market. It's an asset. So we've got inflation at the asset level. Lumber is a commodity, just like oil, just like gas, just like gold. You know, these things are, you know, commodities that are just, it's all speculative bubbles right now. Um, as soon as the housing market slows down a little bit, which if interest rates go up, housing market slows down, there's no more demand. Labor is another big one. We already have a labor problem. We already had one mm -hmm. going into, you know, coronavirus. Yeah. The only thing that could really affect that and create hyperinflation there would be a, uh, a universal base income or guaranteed mm -hmm. jobs program that would create hyperinflation at the labor level, because if the government starts hiring everybody who's out of work right now, 30% of the population or whatever it is, yeah. um, or the workforce that's able to work and starts putting them to work at 15 bucks an hour, now the private sector has to compete with that, you know, to get them back. Yeah. So that, you know, and laborization. So if you get a blue wave or unionization, I mean, if you get a blue wave, you know, what's that all about? Unions. So you start getting unions everywhere, boom. You know, now you got hyperinflation at the labor level. What does that do to the economy? Bam, yeah. tanks it because now you can't produce goods and services because you can't afford to. People won't pay. So at, at a point, consumers will push back and go, a hundred dollars at Burger King, I ain't going. Right. Fifty bucks at McDonald's, sorry, we're not going. We'll we'll grill burgers at home. You know right. what I mean? Yeah. So unless those incomes increase exponentially across the board and everybody all of a sudden gets a bunch of free money put in their hands, you're not going to see consumer spending spike to a level where you can have any kind of real inflation. You've got it at the asset level because that's where the money's going. Yeah. So in your opinion, the Fed is on hold. Do you think they're on hold for four years? Three, four years? You know, I don't know. I don't know how long because, you know, it's going to take the ability and the appetite to let the market fail and tank. Mm. Okay. Real estate, and the stock market. And it's the only thing that has kept both of them going since 2008-9 is QE yeah. okay. and monetary policy. So you think, you think it could be like Japan where they've been basically on hold for 30 years or 20 years or whatever it's been? That's the only examples we have of okay. those types of countries with that type of a situation. And again, we've been doing QE since 08-09. Yeah. We've been, monetary policy has been pretty much consistent. And every time they've tried to raise rates, what happens? Mm -hmm. Market sells off, they have to go back and drop it again. And we haven't had hyperinflation at yeah. the consumer level. Yeah. We haven't had it. So yeah. the question is, can you get it? How much liquidity can the Fed really pump into the economy? And it's not going where it needs to go in order to create inflation. That's the problem. Yeah. Very cool. So the question is, what if they go spend money on infrastructure? Okay, mm -hmm. we had that conversation once and they start building roads and bridges and buildings and this and that. 
you know, now that could potentially create um, inflation at the consumer level because you're hiring people, putting people to work. The problem is we don't have the workforce. Mm-hmm. So if you, again, if you wanted to hire everybody in the country right now and put them to work, there aren't enough people out there apparently, you know, yeah. able to do that to where we could, could create that kind of a situation. You have to yeah. start bringing people in. Yeah, well, that's that's actually one of the things that I see being inflation related. Because again, it's back to your they've you you've got to compete with someone, right? The labor force is out there. It's just more people are employed, but how many are underemployed? How many are employed part time? Right? right? Are they employed in the right place? Right? There's this whole geographical spread, right? There's maybe maybe people are here and they're not there, and there's a lot you know there's a lot of transitory data out there, but. Yeah, well, that's where we came pre-COVID, right? What was the unemployment rate was what? Three and a half. percent? Three and a yeah. half. Pre-COVID. So, I mean, we were already there. Yeah, but again, I go back to, I think that I think that is one thing that has structurally changed. I'm going to call pre-COVID kind of the old economy. We were just, we were getting incrementally, incrementally better in lots of places. Now this 18 month crisis or whatever it's been, I do see the, the economy being fundamentally different. It's going to be disruptive jobs. Some industries are going to go away. Others are going to come in. Uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's going to be, it's going to be different. And that churn is going to create lots of entrepreneurship opportunities to our first video, right? If you want to be, you know, someone who goes out there and risks, uh, you're going to get to consolidate and you're going to get to go anew. Um, it's, it's going to be fun to watch, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you're out there right now and you're listening, start a plumbing company, electrical company, HVAC company. That's Absolutely. where the big money is in construction right now. There you go. Well, thank you for that, man. Uh, This has been fun. Thanks.